Okay, first of all, I think the most important thing to address um, from the outset is what is exactly cultural diplomacy? Would you define that, please? Well, um, we have to start with the word culture. Okay. The trouble with the word culture is that uh, in the Spanish language, cultura, everybody knows what cultura is. Mm -hmm. And in French, everybody knows what culture is. But when we talk about it in America, most people think culture means something that you do on Saturday night when you haven't got any, th any work to do. In other words, it's a diversion, it's a movie, it's an orchestra, it's a ballet. Mm -hmm. You go and look at a painting. But so it, it has nothing to do seriously with life. Whereas the anthropologists define culture as that which makes a society what it is. It provides the identity of society. And so when I say cultural diplomacy, I mean that diplomacy which takes place when one culture meets another culture and they interface or interact. Now, then I go on to say that most cultures, when they interact, they, they meet like this, or maybe they meet like this, or maybe they don't meet quite at all. Mm -hmm. But basically that happens by itself, because movies, cinema goes over country lines, books go over country lines, TV goes over country lines, people go over country lines in order to be tourists, they even bring back a bride or a, or a husband, uh, they even marry, uh, they, the world has a way of of going over country lines. That happens, you see. But diplomacy is something that governments do. And when governments see that the natural relations between countries are not working as well as they should, let's say they're working pretty well up here, but over here they're not working at all. Then they say, well, maybe we better take a look about that and see if there's some way we can encourage the private sector to do a better job. Let's say, for example, that uh, during, uh, in, a, in a country, let's say in Europe, they've been teaching economics as part of the philosophy department. Mm -hmm. Whereas in the United States, as you know, Kristen, when, they, when we study mathematics today, you begin with algebra and then you go on to calculus. And if you're not pretty good at calculus and very sophisticated statistics, you cannot do economics in the United States. And so there was a time when the two economic communities didn't talk to each other at all. And it took a certain number of years before European uh, econ economists discovered mathematics and American disco uh, economists discovered what we might call philosophy, the thought around economics. And so uh, that kind of matching and mixing is what uh, cultural diplomats try to do. Mm -hmm. now, there are three, three baskets into which this falls when you look over the relationships between, let's say, Spain and the United States. There are wonderful relationships which are working just perfectly. Everything is going well. You don't have to worry about them very much, but you must pay attention to them and make sure they're going well. And just mm -hmm. Then there's a second category where things are going pretty well, but maybe not entirely. And then there's a third category where nothing's happening at all. For example, 20 years ago in Spain, there were no library schools. There was no way to train a librarian. So every library was arranged in its own way. Mm -hmm. uh, books were thrown together because they were red or big or whatever uh, in a library, and you couldn't find them. So the whole idea of retrieving information and then librarianship uh, grew up and was taught as quite scientifically and systematically in the United States beginning around 1850. Mm -hmm. So uh, library schools became something that we could share with Spain. And one by one, they're beginning to uh, to grow now in uh, in Spain. You know, probably, I think we will see more of them because it's a very important field. So that's the, those are the three possibilities. And when, when something's not happening, we try to make it happen. In cases where something's happening, but it's going in the wrong direction. Let's say, for example, political theory uh, is so heavily based in, in the teachings of Karl Marx that you can't possibly uh, talk about anybody else, as it happened in certain countries to the east of here. And so once you get into that situation, you say, well, you know, we want to, we want to introduce the notion that there's some other philosophers of, of politics 
who've had something to say. And besides, all political systems do not work the same way. What works in Bulgaria may not work in Texas. What works in Texas may not work in New Jersey. Mm -hmm. And so uh, these are the things that we need to uh, keep our eye on. And it's a very different thing from, uh, from public relations or uh, advertising or, or, above all, from propaganda. Because mm -hmm. propaganda is information used in order to persuade another country to do what you want. And if you have to lie to do it, then you do. Whereas what we talk about is uh, if a cultural attaché has to lie about something, then he must be doing the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. Okay? Okay. How has cultural diplomacy changed throughout the years? In 1938, uh, the uh, State Department set up a cultural program which was purely cultural. It was exchange of libraries, exchange of students, exchange of professors. It was, ex it, it was universities to universities. In 1946, uh, with the beginnings of the Cold War, people got scared. And they said, the Soviets are drowning us in propaganda, and we have no defense. And therefore, since they're telling lies, we have to tell the truth. So we then set up what could have been seen as a, a counter-propaganda program. And we call it information, but that was a euphemism for propaganda or counter-propaganda in this case. The two then got together in the same agency in 1953, and that produced the agency called USIA, that you are too young to remember. And they, the two uh, lived together in sort of harmony for 27 years, sort of harmony, mm -hmm. except that the cultural officers in USIA were always the low men. They, they never got promoted to the top levels. Uh, they never became the public affairs officers. And so they were second-rate citizens, as it were. And so it didn't work very well. And the trouble was that in USIA, if you look at the graph, the cultural presence in USIA steadily, gradually, but steadily went downward. And so that your, your staffing, your budgets, and so forth, meant less and less for cultural affairs. It is true that the public sector public sector, I mean the private sector, the foundations and the universities, were doing many, many things. But that was the point of it, that we were supposed to be helping to do that better. Mm -hmm. And uh, it didn't always work that way. So that by the time we got to 1999, the, uh, the agency, uh, USIA, had become fully a public diplomacy agency in which cultural affairs was there, but it was increasingly neglected smaller staffs in the field, closing all the libraries, turning them into IRCs, as we call them now, uh, no longer teaching English, no longer doing any of the things that we used to do instinctively. And the Fulbright program, which managed to stay approximately at the same budget, the trouble is when something stays at the same budget, it means it declines because inflation goes up. And if it stays at the same budget, you're going down. So it hasn't risen appreciably. It has survived uh, because people love the Fulbright program. There are 400,000 alumni of the Fulbright program in the world, of which about 100,000 in the United States. And whenever I come into an office like yours, I wear my Fulbright necktie mm -hmm. and uh, so that I, I'm known as a Fulbright person. Okay, and you got that tie wear? Pardon me? Where did you get that time? Well, uh, many of the commission, the Fulbright commissions in different countries, I don't know if you have one in Spain, this one came from Japan. Okay. As you can see on the back, it's 50, and there's the American flag, and here's the Japanese flag. And this was the 50th anniversary of the Fulbright Commission in Spain. But I have one from Aust Austria, and I have one from Germany, and I have one from, oh, I forget where. Uh-huh, so many places. Yep.